Well, 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 fangirls and fanboys, if it isn't episode 52 of Electric Fan Cave on ElectricBeast.com, Corrigan Vaughn and Kristen Latterell here, and in this episode, we're out of the office. That's right, this one's coming to you from Rogue Machine Theater in sunny Los Angeles. We're hanging out with screenwriter slash actor slash playwright John Polono. We're going to find out where he's going and where he's been. We're going to try to get him excited about some movie trailers he's never seen, and we'll attempt to talk over the comings and goings of a busy L.A. theater. The show must go on, am I right? Right. And, uh, yeah, I think it's important that we point out, uh, just from the get-go, this one um, has has bad words in it. Lots uh, of bad words. Lots of bad words. You know, I often, I usually go through and I, you know, edit them out, although I occasionally miss them or things like that. But um, there comes a point where you just gotta, you just gotta, like, let it roll. Let it go. So, if that's a problem, turn off this podcast now. Don't do it. Turn back, Sarah. Bad news bears. Labyrinth. Come on. Oh, okay. Oh, that's yeah. right. You only watched it that one time. That one time. And I was like old, too old for it, I think. Yeah, you were too old for so, it. Sorry. I tried to introduce La- uh, Laddie to Labyrinth a few years ago. It was not as successful as one would have hoped. No. <sighs> that, that'd be a lesson. Get your kids started early. But we went to Rogue Machine Theater. Yes. L.A. Kristen, that was so bomb. It was super fun. Like, really fun. And it was like felt cold to be backstage. I know. Even though it was like... Not really probably that cool, but I felt like we were cool. It felt, it felt neat. I, I was, there was a little danger of potentially us breaking ourselves. Kristen and I are not the most coordinated people in the world. Yeah. And, and John Polona is leading us through these these winding... Through a labyrinth, if you a will. A labyrinth. Mm-hmm. Turn back, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> he's leading us through this back thing, and I'm just like, I'm going to break. I'm going to fall over. This ladder is where I die. But at least yeah. I got to be And then it was like a dark LA room, theater. and you couldn't find the light switch. I'm like, this is just never going to work for us. Yeah, this is where we die. We need yeah. flat surfaces with lots of light. <laughs> exactly. Also, yeah, I should apologize for that. Um, that it is well lit, but uh, because I was using not my computer and the seating arrangements in it, me and John just are like constantly wobbling out of the. And the I'm picture. awkwardly in there by myself. In the middle. And I'm like. Hands folded, like, doo ba doo. Also, my hands are weird in it because they're in the shot and I don't know what to do with them. And so I'm like, <laughs> it's great but seriously for one thing like it was so cool to get to talk to john because he is like the nicest guy on the planet he is and just cool yeah like super rad just it's like just someone chill. you've known your whole life yeah you know? and he just was i just felt he just felt really freed and like the stuff some of the stuff he shared was just i don't know just felt like a super insightful and he didn't hold back yeah um which i think we've already warned you about uh <laughs> But yeah, in the I best possible you. way. Yeah, though. in the yeah. best possible. It was in a good way, you yeah. know. And I just feel like it's really real, and you just get to hear some like his frustrations, and you get to really kind of understand and get a glimpse of like who he was and why he writes the things that he does, and um, yeah. and the yeah, insight into so sort really of what's fun. going on in the LA theater scene, I think, was it was something that I wasn't aware of with the equity issues, and you'll hear about that okay. in um, this pl- this uh, podcast and in the rant and rave set that we went to afterwards, which was really cool. Um, they talked about this a lot. What Rant and Rave is, and if you're in the LA area, I highly recommend to see this uh, highly flyer recommend. here. Highly recommend. Six storytellers go up and they tell basically like 10 minute um, stories based on a word that's a theme. So this week was adaptation. I think they do this once a month. Yeah. Um, and the stories were just so incredible. Um, they, yeah. were, they were tear jerkers. They were really funny ones. They were... I mean, it but was. They were it, also like both. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think there was only one that was pretty. No, they were all like had these moments. It's just like they walked that edge of like you're laughing, and then you're like, I like, might oh. cry right now, or just like not even cry, just like oh, whoa, hey, oh, yeah. like this is getting real all of a sudden. You know what I mean? And it was just, ugh, they're so heartfelt. And I think it was because they were all. These weren't just like stories they made up of like mm-hmm. random people. It was like these were stories of times in their life when they had to adapt to something. Yeah. A change, um, a growing experience, uh, and it was just so real and awesome yeah. to like hear these stories. And they were funny, and I, I feel like they were able to look back on the, these moments with this like just this great sense of humor, mm-hmm. um, but also a sense of like this is what I learned from it, and yeah. this is how I've grown since then. And um, yeah, it was a great mix, really great mix, and I actually really enjoyed it. At first, I wasn't sure what I felt about it, but then like. Yeah. Like, by, like, halfway through the first story, I'm like, okay. Yeah. 
I'm okay. in. I see you. Yeah. I see. At the end, at the especially at the end of the first guy's story, his name was what, Patrick Flanagan. I Patrick think was Flanagan, the first guy, yeah. and telling the story about his father-in-law and him. And like, because at first I wasn't really sure where the stories were going. Because I'm like, <laughs> I know the words adapt, but I'm not really sure where he was going. And then at the end, just like the way he tied it in, I was like, Oh, <laughs> that was so just great. really beautiful, you know. And so it was just really fun. So yeah, if you guys are in the area, yeah. um, if and, you can check yeah. out the website, they have it's um, um. I don't know what it is. Roguemachinetheater.com? Org? It's not actually not on here. They only have an email, which is not fun. So Email? Wait, okay. We're going to look it up. But yeah, look roguemachinetheater.com. Like, Check it out. Rogue Machine Theater, and they'll tell you the dates. And I think they were saying that next month's word is greed, oh, which yeah. I think will be interesting. That's super so. cool. And one of the other things that was really fun about this, too, was the closeness of this scene, yeah. right? So it felt like when they introduced people, a lot of people in the audience knew them, and not just in the sense that it's like they came there to support their friend, but in the sense that um, this small theater scene is something that people really actively support and want to be parts of. I mean, the po- podcast version of um, the the show, we talked to the people who record it and everything, and they were saying basically, you know, they were fans, and they came and they were like, this is great, it kind of reminds us of The Moth, like, what would you think of us recording this for you? And that's the sort of community that's existing around yeah. Rogue Machine and probably a lot of these small LA theaters that, again, are in crisis at this moment. Um, and so it was really cool to see the support system that was there and uh, the way they interacted as a result of that. And um, we saw, like, there were multiple people in the audience and performing that we recognized from, you know, TV and movies and things like that. And they're just all there sort of hanging out and being buds and yeah. supporting other people's art. So it was a really cool, kind of inspiring evening. Totally. To yeah, and I think you never think of, I don't know, I guess I don't usually think of L.A. as, like, a big theater yeah. or even a little theater, like... Mm-hmm. there's like Pantages and I see musicals there sometimes you know what I mean and that's what I usually think of yeah. I would never have said this last night they probably would have thrown me out um, <laughs> but uh, just kidding they were all very nice actually yeah. like weirdly Super nice I'm nice. like it's almost like this is they're like too nice to us I feel like at it's any like point someone, they're gonna know that we don't belong here but they didn't seem to care it's when like we were the, like yeah, spazzy and weird world's um, end or whatever it's like yeah in exactly there, aliens but uh, anyway, so you usually think of like, oh, New York's like where the theater is. But I'm like, this was a very tight knit, just cool little community and just almost like a little like enclave of awesomeness. And yeah. so um, it was yeah, just a little I was surprised by it and just love it. It was yeah, it was awesome. So, yeah. so yeah, check it out, if you're in you the area, check them out wherever you are. Support your local theater because local it's cool. Theater. It's just so much fun. Yeah. I love this kind of thing. So we will get to that. Um, interview uh, momentarily. Um, we do have to acknowledge and congratulate a certain Benedict Cumberbatch. I would who, throw if I had rice, I'd throw yeah. it. But apparently, I'm not we're throwing to imaginary rice and Yay. flowers dun, and things like dun, that. Dun, 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 dun. That isn't that pomp and circumstance. It's like the graduation song. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I don't know. Dun, 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 oh, that's dun, it. Dun, 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 dun. I am, and then I almost started going. Duh. I almost started singing the same one again, but lower. <laughs> oh boy! Dun, dun, dun. And then I started doing, almost doing like, the Darth Vader one. Oh, that's the no, funeral that's... one. That wasn't even oh Darth God. Vader. Duh. Dang it! I'm struggling. There it is. <laughs> Oh, jeez, Louise. Oh, well, um, hopefully you played none of those songs at your wedding, <laughs> yeah. Benedict. But hey, congratulations. You guys are yeah. adorable. Precious. And guess who was there? Tom Hiddleston. Tom <laughs> Hiddleston. Who we will briefly talk about in this episode. We as will, well. actually. But um, yeah, so, Ben, we're stoked for you, dude. We're so stoked. We can't You're... wait to see your kidly wink. Oh, my. Yeah. G- your what? Kidly wink. Kid. Is that. Child. Oh, is that slang for child? It is when I say it. Hmm. Yeah, accept it. Okay. I'm into it. Move on. Okay. Uh, yeah, Good. that's exciting. And and Melanie Ray wanted to make sure that we brought that up. And yes, so we our Mel. I almost said condolences. No, our congratulations. Wow. Yeah, I'm this just is, okay. Listen, I, you guys, we were out kind of late last night. We had to drive and back I, to our respective homes from LA, and I kind of got lost a little bit. So did you? Yeah. Well, only because I was trying to. Never mind. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> It was, and it was too, way past my bedtime, and I was, yeah. like, all hopped up on mac and cheese, so. Yeah, we went to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles afterwards, and if you've never had that, I'm so sorry about your life. Yeah, you um, really should rectify that at some point. Yeah, so, yeah, it happens. 
So shall we? On with the interview. Have I missed on- anything? No. All right, let's do this. So hey, hey welcome. Thanks. We're so Thanks excited for that you're here. Thanks for yeah. coming. Yeah, I'd say welcome to the electric fan cave like usual, but we yeah. actually are in your turf. Yes. It sounds like a nice cave. I wish I would have seen that. It is a nice cave. You know, any old time, just come on down. You can hang out in the fan cave. Um, we're super glad to have you here. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what you're working on now and where we are. Actually, can we start with that? Because, sure. like, what is this Rogue Machine action? Oh, well, right now we're in the, one of the dressing rooms for Rogue Machine Theater, yes. which is a theater that we started in uh, 2008. And we've been doing it. We're actually dark right now. We're here tonight because a, a show that I produce with a, a producing partner, Roxanne Hart. We do a monthly storytelling series where... She and I get, uh, we do it about 10 times a year today, tonight is I think the 56th show we started our first wow. year. Yeah, it's a great fundraiser for the theater. It gets a lot of people going, but most importantly is like we really work with writers mm-hmm. and you know, we give them a prompt and we curate it, we edit the pieces and you'll see tonight you have six writers who all riff on a word that we give them. Great. Tonight the word is adaptation. So people have different takes on it and, and uh, yeah, it's really kind of a profound cool event. Some people allow us to record it and podcast it. Some people get so personal and stuff that they don't want us mm-hmm. to, which is cool, but it's got like a very, uh, really cool following. It's not, um, it's some people, the writers really just always feel very sort of open to be funny and raunchy and soul bearing. I mean, we've had some, <laughs> some where people say stuff and you're just like, holy shit, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's great. So anyway, that, that's, that's, uh, that's why we're here tonight. And, right. Uh, so yeah, this is our theater for now, for the time being at least. And how did this so place this... get started? I mean, what is this generally what you do? Is these like basically focusing on writers? No, or... no, no, no. That's just sort of a one-off thing. I mean, one of the mm-hmm. beauties of like when you run a theater, uh, when you have a theater company that's in residence somewhere is you can just be really creative with the programming. Yeah. When I first started in the theater and there was just like a handful of us, uh, including my... Uh, wife now uh who i kind of met we started and we would like i would write a bunch of one-act plays and we'd get a couple others from other writers and we'd produce like a night so we'd rent out the space get directors and do it all from scratch every time then you you know do that and then you'd go dark for like a year and do something else so you you know it took a long time it's a lot of work to to generate an audience each time Mm -hmm. so we did that for a while and then in 2006 i wrote my first full-length play it was a play called lost and found and uh there were about eight roles in it, and it was all friends of the theater company. I wrote everybody a role, and we did this play, and we advertised in, um, I think it was either Craigslist or Big Cheap. I don't know if you know what Big Cheap is. It's, it's a Yahoo user group for theater, uh, like low-budget theater in L.A. It's like a really Yahoo kind of user community. Does that still exist? Yeah, oh, still exists. That's pretty darned. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I posted there, saying we're looking for a director for this thing, and then John Flynn, who had just gotten off executive producing Strong Medicine, He's like, yeah, sure, I'll read it. He read it, he really dug it. We met, and, um, you know, he came aboard, which, you know, in retrospect is kind of amazing. He did, considering we were, like, 80% cast, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So then we rehearsed it out of my garage, my Jen awesome. and I, my wife's garage. We had a little, our daughter was, I think it's like, two years old at the time. And we had, like, a baby monitor, and we would <laughs> rehearse in the backyard. And then um, we did the play at the Lounge Theater. Mm-hmm. And at that point, we had done three or four little productions, so we had 501c3 status. Oh, wow. Had a great time, yeah. and, you know, John Flynn was just, it clicked with everybody. So then a, about a year and a half later, when he said he was starting this theater company, he got involved, and our little theater company became sort of the umbrella 501c3 corporation to uh, start Rogue Machine, and then our, our theater company got absorbed, and then he kind of brought all these different people together, and then we started this and rented this place, and we gutted it pretty much, and... There's a theater theater had like a presence here, but it was a very raw space, so we put in all the stuff. I was going to say, I saw the like theater theater outside. Yeah. We walked we and we're like, like, is this Are right? Yeah, theater theater's <laughs> been here for a long time. This okay. guy, Jeff Murray, and he always had it, and he would rent out the space, but then at the, around the time we were looking for a space, he said, yeah, I'm looking for a partner who can rent it out for like nine months of the year, mm-hmm. and then three months he can do his own programming, which is kind of what he does now. But we're looking for a more permanent home. It's very difficult mm-hmm. in L.A. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of shit going on with uh, theater right now in L.A. I don't know how much really? you guys are aware with. Yeah. No. And we can get into it at some point. It's kind of... Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really... It's union yeah. stuff. It has to do with the oh. equity. Yeah. And that... Uh, it's it's a whole clusterfuck, man. Mm. It's, a, it's okay. a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. We won't, we won't get <laughs> no, we too can get deep into it. Into it's, it you know. it's just... I have very strong opinions on it, but... Um, we like strong opinions. Well, okay. 
so all basically, that. you have equity as changing. It's a 99 seat equity waiver plan, mm -hmm. which means you can produce a play and you can have an equity member, of which I am an equity member, and you pay them. Uh, you don't pay them a lot because these are, you know, we don't have a lot of money to do right. particular plays. So you get, you know, you get the play, you get the actors, and you know, you kind of work for very little. And I've done many of those plays, but you get to work on amazing work. Right. The flip side of that is to work in an equity show, which I've done. And they're much harder to get those roles, um, and they don't necessarily tend to always be the material that's like pushing the cutting edge, mm -hmm. because when you're pushing that edge, you make shit that might fail, like small engine repair. We did that on a budget of maybe less than a thousand bucks as a oh, late night show. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and but it know, did not fail. Too. No, that was huge. <laughs> but what I'm saying yeah. is, is, we got to push the envelope with yeah, something. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And now what Equity wants to do is change that Equity waiver thing so that. Act, all equity actors will receive minimum wage for the duration of their rehearsal process and up the payment. And what that would, in essence, do is it would, you know, bankrupt a lot of theaters that couldn't, oh, wow. couldn't do it. Because as opposed to saying, hey, we have this little bit of money, let's go put on a show, it would now have to, you know, have to be at a whole other level. And it's right. just not, you know, L.A. is in a transitional period. And look, I understand the frustration we all want. LA theater to flourish the way other cities do, mm -hmm. and there's a there's a big audience of theater goers yeah. here. I mean, we have the biggest uh, you know Lort theater, uh, CTG, all of those at that high level. It's just there's a lot of theaters, and, and the complaint is that there's it's the market is saturated with bad material and stuff, mm. <laughs> bad productions and things. So anyway, they want it's sort of a slash and burn thing that Equity's doing, and a right. lot of practitioners such as myself are very frustrated and do not want that to happen because yeah. we you know, or pour so much of our life's blood into into yeah. LA theater, which doesn't pay you money. You don't do it for a living, you do it for the passion, but it can lead to other things, which it right. oh, certainly has in my case. Yeah. I mean, obviously you uh you started with small engine repair out here, right? Yeah. And then you took that to New York right. afterwards. Uh I mean what what is what is that like being sort of you're a bi coastal guy in general. You're from New Hampshire, yeah? Yeah. And uh, living out here in LA, which is always <clears throat> interesting. I'm a New Englander myself. Oh yeah, so. where are you from? Massachusetts, Western Mass. Oh nice. Yeah. Um, and you guys so get dumped on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thankfully I'm not there to <laughs> get right. dumped on, but it's a bad My time. My parents have like semi pictures, like six feet of snow. In oh, there. it's insane, it's isn't it? Oh man. Yeah. It's. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a huge California gal, but it's a nice time to be here. <laughs> yeah. To be honest. Um. So when you're taking something from LA to New York, and New York is obviously, I mean, sort of theater central. People look at that as like that's that's the goal. What is that like as like a, a playwright, as an actor, to be able to. Uh, make that transition over to New York, and do you feel like a difference in in what it's like to put on a show there versus here? Or, right, uh, the so vibe. Good question. Uh, you know, coincidentally, the play Lost and Found that I did in two thousand and six. Mm -hmm. In two thousand and ten, I did it as a fringe New York okay. play with a, this director Andrew Block, mm -hmm. who was a former Rogue Machine member who moved out to New York. <laughs> so we went over and we did that, and it was a really, really big success. It opened up a lot of doors. It had a lot of attention. So that was my first sort of taste. We ran at the Lucille Lortel, this amazing theater, and you know it, it really kind of you get a lot more attention there. And New York yeah. has a different sort of vibe. I mean, LA theater scene is great, and there are great mm -hmm. audiences here. It's yeah. just it's not as much of the culture here. Part of that, I, personally, I think, is public transportation and yeah. Yeah. sort of our sort of provincial <laughs> way that LA is spread out there. But you know, people just go to theater more, and it's just they talk about it more there. Um, Anyway, so I did that in 2010, and then um, I we were trying to get that produced commercially over there, and it was it's a fucking nightmare doing that. And, uh, oh, really? It's so hard. You need so much money. So then I... <laughs> I guess that's not that surprising. Yeah. No, I mean, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. Insane how hard it is. Uh, whereas, whereas here, you write shit and you put up. So yeah. I had this small engine repair thing with that director in mind, mm -hmm. and... Um, I kind of got inspired by it while I was out there after a show one night for Lost and Found. And then, so I wrote this thing and, and we read it in Andrew's living room and then he came out and directed it and you know, we cast it. Got really lucky because it was this incredible cast. <laughs> and it's late night. My wife runs the late night here. And what that means is that there'll be a main stage show mm -hmm. in either the big space or the small space. In this case, it was a small space. It was a play by Cormac McCarthy called Sunset Limited mm -hmm. that ran from like 8 to 10 10 10 or whatever right so at 10 10 when all the audience left david mauer who was designed our set he would go and he would take our set and click it onto their set 
and then we changed in the hallway, and then at ten thirty, wow. people came and sat, and then we did the play. I mean, we changed you wow. know, wow. in the hallway or sometimes outside, and and uh, yeah, it was crazy. And then but we just walk. See, so good thing it's it. warm here because I know, right? Be doing that. You don't have to worry. About it. <laughs> but we took a. Di- I mean, because the play was definitely boundary pushing, and it was like mm-hmm. what we call like late night fair, which tends to be you know more explicit language and situation so it was the first thing I'd ever written as a play where I was like fuck it I'm just not even gonna care about right it. not that I've ever been so certainly not politically correct mm-hmm. uh, not in a bratty way like oh I'm gonna say what I want but I never really kind of held back but with this yeah. I was like seeing a couple late night plays by like Adam Rapp and a couple other people because uh, I really wasn't raised in theater and like mm-hmm. I, I've probably you know there was a point where I had been in as many plays as I had seen you know what I mean just right. kind of learning it as I did it so seeing these other plays including Sunset Limit which was so bleak and challenging to be like well fuck it I'm just gonna like really just push it so we yeah. did that and of course it helps have my wife be the late night producer and John Flynn now who produced it with her yeah and we just did it and, and it really really took on a uh, life of its own we ran here for I'm like shit I think it was like Eight months or something like oh, that. Oh wow! As yeah. only the late night one. No, we ran at late night, and okay. it was it did so well that we transitioned to the main stage here in prime time, and that did really really well. And then our season, we had a rental come in that we had to leave, and then we we remounted it at Beverly Hills Playhouse. Oh okay, so you just were like it was a steady sort of moving on up. Totally, with totally. This. And then we, I mean, we really could have kept running. Yeah. It's just everybody had to leave, and we were fatigued and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, and you had um, your original cast had like John Bernthal was in John it. John Bernthal, yeah, and yeah. he was uh, he had to move on to you know doing big TV. He did. Things, he went. Right? He did. Uh, <laughs> you know, we got him really. He's one of my best friends now. Uh, in fact, we're working on another couple of things. Oh, great! Together, and so he uh, there was some interest in New York to do small engine repair. They had some readings. We had some like real heavyweight producers involved in it, and they did one reading which was really good. And the actors were great, but I just was like, it was so hard to watch them. Because you know, I wanted to do it, and then John has a production company. Yeah. Sorry. Is that going to be a problem? That music? It'll just be Whatever. like a It'll background. background music. I just don't want to pay license. We'll music. just sway. So yeah. his production company said, "Well, fuck it, let's do it." And then we brought it out. We partnered with MCC, and we did it. And mm-hmm. then John was supposed to be in that play too, but yeah. then he got the Brad Pitt movie like right like before. <laughs> so then Badge came in and did it. And, yeah. Uh, which yeah. which was actually the reason that I went and saw this uh, play in the first place, and I'm glad I did because that led me then to Lost. Oh, because of Badge. But, I have like literally, it's so embarrassing, but I've seen literally every single thing like movie wise that he's been oh, in. Oh, I know, I love him too. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't blame you at all. Yeah, so I was like, oh my gosh, I happen to be in Jersey right now. Like, I'm like right here. I should go and see it. Do you know and, if you want to, uh, I can try to turn that thing off. Is that going to be a problem? Um, I don't know. What do you think? Platform. I have no idea. I, don't I know think, think it's fine. Like. All right, all right, it's go. Okay. But, all right. Yeah, I think it's okay if it's background. But that was why I ended up going oh, really? and, and seeing it. And so, you know, that was a lot of fun. And that cast was great. I think it's funny you mentioned like, you know, having this, the late night thing and it being a little more explicit and everything. The funny thing for me going to see that as like the like badge fan in the audience was then most of the audience were uh, Keegan Allen fans. Oh, yeah. I was like, you guys are all too young oh to be God. seeing that this. That was great. Was that weird being like, that this was is very like, weird. This you know, the play like defies, expe- that yeah. play specifically defied expectations in the sense of how people got it. And I got to mm-hmm. say from the beginning, I was always so happy that women love the play yeah and it's it's a feminist piece told in very sort of blatant misogynistic language right but it's about women yeah 100 percent. and they got that and that's always nice and validating mm-hmm. as a writer and it was a huge leap for me as a writer to see you know that people kind of get it if you put your heart into it and you're truthful yeah and you know we had uh, for the most part and it, you know la loved it it was off the rails huge success i gotta say in new york Huge success. People loved it, but there were some more sensitive viewers really? in New York than there were here. That's actually Part surprising. Of it, I think is like you come to a play at ten thirty. Rogue Machine has a very specific brand of these mm-hmm. like sort of envelope pushing stuff. Right. I think you go to MCC. We had some people, um, and they kind of were turned off uh, right. initially. And you know, look, I think there was a section of uh, like the gay audience in in. Um, in New York who was very offended by it which mm-hmm. made me sad because I was like I'm just kind of showing these guys how they talk that I know sure. you know I don't believe that but that's kind of how it is and and uh, not everyone I'm not, I'm, I hate to generalize but I will right, say that the people who were offended were, were that sort of makeup mm-hmm. and I think they weren't expecting to see that in theater mm-hmm. whereas the, we didn't have that issue as much in LA Yeah. and I think as we did it where it's a grimier place Road Machine is that and MCC is a little more like you know not expecting to be offended yeah, but, right. <laughs> but yeah. I will say like uh, another thing that was really pleasantly surprising is when with Keegan we were like oh shit all these teenage girls are flying out yeah. they're like 
we saw like 13 year olds like oh my god and, yeah. and they would put they would put in the ad they're like explicit sexual do not and even Keegan did a little thing on his like <laughs> Twitter thing or whatever yeah. he's like don't come yeah. and they did and we saw a lot of them afterwards and a lot of the mothers came up like all the girls the like 14 year olds would run up to Keegan but then yep. their mothers would come up to me yeah <laughs> and, uh, and you're like okay. you're a little worried like, oh god what are they gonna I, say you know whatever it's every time every night you will be me and Badge and PJ we went through it every night every time we open the door to go outside you see all these girls and then they're like <laughs> <laughs> and you get used to it because you love Keegan. I mean, he's great. Yeah. But he's got his fans from that show. So, but the yeah. moms would come up and they'd be like, "Listen, we, the, you know, they're like ten minutes into this play. We thought this was the worst mistake we ever made. Yeah. But getting through it, we were really glad that they came. Not that it's got like an after-school message or anything like that, right. but it's good. It's like a talking point. It's mm-hmm. like they kind of see it. And and that was sort of a. It's not like I sat down and was like, "Here is a play about." A topic that needs to be explored. Right. The dangers of social media. Right. <laughs> Not like that shit. Yeah. But it's kind of an offshoot. I think. Look, I think when you when you create something, if you go for the jugular and you're just super truthful, mm-hmm. um, then you're gonna you're gonna touch something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you just get raw and truthful and, and don't pull any punches. So yeah, that that was great. Um, yeah, absolutely. But at I first, think, it yeah. was nerve wracking. Yeah. And they're taking pictures and stuff, and we're like, the play is about. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so they're going I to Instagram like and it. Yeah. yeah. They were, yeah. and that was cool, like to kind of see that whole thing. And but a lot of these girls, I mean, they were great, and they went there, and they were like, they would go out and they'd say, you know, I went because I loved Keegan, but by the end, I hated him. And, like, <laughs> I loved you guys, and I wanted you to, because yeah. it's the inversion of the whole thing. It I mean, is. You know, yeah. spend time with these guys and, and it's interesting with the sets of characters in this that like you're constantly in this like adjustment of how you feel about them you know I love yeah. you this minute I hate you this minute and like I don't know what to make of it um, and using as you put it like these misogynistic ways of expressing a, a feminist message is right. you know to me it felt very unique you know and I love seeing people kind of talk the way real people talk it's like I always quote that um Holden Caulfield line when uh, he mm-hmm. says like I hate actors they don't act like people they just right. think they do right. and so it's, it's, it was refreshing for yeah. me to sort of uh, watch it in that way but you also mentioned this is like you know it's about women or for women in uh, in much of the, this sort of way that it still revolves around these guys and then with Lost Girls it's very more Absolutely. clearly like a woman story so like why? Well you know <laughs> Lost Girls is a uh... I just doing small engine repair, but he was like, like "Oh, you got to do the female version of this." Mm, mm-hmm. And I kind of had so much of that residual thematic stuff from that, and I kind of was like, "I'm not going to do the female version of it," but right. although I would love uh, for women to do small engine repair, I think that would kind of be amazing. Uh, yeah, I would. Love, <laughs> yeah, I really would want. That I'm not sure how it. the big moment in it would play out, but I think well, no, they just have yeah. uh, <laughs> playing men. Yeah. Oh, there. Oh, there you go. Okay. I think that would be great. Sure. Anyway, but uh, so Lost Girls, it was like, how would the, what is the female version of? And, mm-hmm. you know, I know, like, in my own family, for whatever reason, there's been a lot of generation after generation of, you know, teenage pregnancies. And, mm-hmm. again, it wasn't like a, an after-school special. It was rather that, for me, it's a very complicated thing, which is when you're in a really, when you're having a hard time growing up and you're in a place where you maybe feel like you don't have that much of a future and you fall in love, it's a deeper, more dangerous, mm. uh, raw thing. Yeah. you may ever experience in your life and a lot of people get sucked into that yeah. because this is the best it will ever be and that's sort of the Lost Girls thing is that for Maggie our main character it was it was the best moment and sort of the you know what is the event that has to happen is she kind of has to let that go and I kind of was like well how do you show that without you know how do you show that and have an audience sympathize with it or rather, rather fall in love at 17 years old mm-hmm the same time without making a judgment like oh that won't work out and that's sort of the structure of that piece was all about creating that complicated emotional thing do you know what I'm saying yeah Mm -hmm. absolutely I mean that's what it was all about and no it's not like you know Small Engine Repair had a thriller and it has all that stuff but it's really a very same similar like minor chord playing Mm -hmm. through the both of them of these sort of people who were sort of broken and trying to do the best that they can and you know Maggie ultimately I think similar to Frank who is a very heroic figure in her own way of, yeah. you know she broke the cycle she really did mm-hmm. and the only way she did that is by putting her child before her which no one had ever done historically right. in this family yeah and I mean you're also hitting on like in these both of these plays this very like working class and again yeah. New England sort of thing so is that coming from like your own sort of background or what grounds you in these characters what yeah I mean look you? you know I, I you know I, I uh definitely grew up in that environment um, where I grew up had sort of it wasn't you know 
uh, oppressed working class. There was mm -hmm. sort of more of a variety. You know, my dad was an engineer, but still, uh, you know, I had a job since I was 14. And, mm -hmm. you know, my parents unfortunately went bankrupt when I was like in high school and we had to, you know, go pay through college and stuff. And, and they've always been really, I've, I've had, uh, you know, I, I never felt like I had to go homeless if I didn't have money. But, right. you know, we didn't have, it wasn't until I moved to like New York and L.A. where I met people who had like wealth that I realized, oh, wow, that was working class. Like, I, yeah. I just didn't know it. You know what I'm saying? Um, and certainly people had it worse. But, you know, I grew up in an environment, you know, my elementary school was uh, 10 feet from a junkyard. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. It was like a telephone poles with uh, tractor tires bolted onto it. <laughs> now the neighborhood's gotten a little bit better. But mm -hmm. back then, and it was just kind of what it was. And. I just, you know, I'm, I'm really, I just know that voice. I know that that area. I, I spent so much of my life sort of uh, terrified that I would never leave it. Mm -hmm. So it's so raw and like real to me. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So I think I have that perspective. It's like you spend your whole life wanting to leave something and then you realize that that's where you draw so much. I mean, it's true, you know, I, a lot of my, very few things that I write take place in, like, L.A., even though I've spent, yeah. you know, a lot of time here as well. But that's just, you know, where I had those formative years, and it's so sort of, like, simple. And I still have, you know, a lot of family there. I'm there a lot. I just, I don't know, I get, I understand that it's just, you know, you were raised there. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think that that's sort of a, you know, those stories aren't told very often. Right. It's something that I knew I brought an authenticity to, you know. Mm hmm which was kind of challenging and, and different. I yeah. just like the way that people like that talk. I just, that's that's how I talk. I just, I get along with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't, absolutely. Like a lot of theater is written, wonderful theater too, is uh, made for people who study theater, who, who have a mm -hmm. greater reference level and have that. I, I never was exposed to that. I never went to a play. And I remember reading a couple of plays, a play by Michael Malley when I was in like acting school. And uh, <clears throat> a play, Those of the River Keep, I don't know if you've Nothing ever read that. Now. Yeah. Why am I spacing on the writer? He's like, oh, my favorite writer. <laughs> Sorry, this happens to us all the time. Does it really? Oh, we'll, yeah. we'll Google it later. We we'll, usually just we'll make up a name it. and then later someone knows we are wrong. Yeah. So it's fine. Sure. If you want to do that, you can't. Yeah. No. What's <laughs> his name? It'll come to me. Because I actually met him when I was in New York. But anyway, they were, they were uh, written in a way that I was like, oh, my God, that's like people I know. And not that mm -hmm. you just need to sit in an audience and see yourself reflected, but it was a way that... Like small engine repair, that's like people I grew up with. I think I, if I didn't go to college, I would have been frank. I was so wanted to marry the girl I was madly in love with when I was 17. Right. Thank God I didn't. <laughs> I could have very easily gone that route. It yeah. was like yeah. that. And like the composites of my friends and what I would have been like, you know what I'm saying? And, and been there, you know, had she gotten pregnant or whatever. Right. And uh, so, you know, I feel that. But then it's funny because you hear reviewers or people, they kind of see the plays as like anthropology. Like we're looking at this yeah. world, and I'm like, I, that's fascinating. Not, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah. it's an inch, you know, it's an interesting keyhole of the. And it always pisses me off when they're like, "And these losers," and I'm like, "This is how most people are." Like, you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, they're yeah. not. Right. Most people struggle to make bills. You know, yeah. I mean, everybody I grew up with, they were worried about money. They, you know, you didn't do shit because you couldn't afford it, not mm -hmm. because you were bored or didn't have time. Right. You just didn't. You didn't have the money to yeah. do it. You grow. I mean. I spent the majority of my life driving a car terrified, like hearing a noise and being like, oh shit, if that breaks, I can't fix it. I'm literally going to lose my job. How am I going to pay? And it's going to be a... And that, that fear is that... I mean, a lot, that's how most people live. Right. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So to me, it's yeah. not like... And then when, I mean, that's got to be interesting for you again, coming out to LA and sort of being, you know, in a different world. LA is you know, in a lot of ways, especially when you're, you know, working with actors and things yeah. like that. There's that huge, like, class divide and those ideas that someone like the people that you're putting in your shows are losers or they made the wrong decisions and things like that. I mean, have you showed, uh, like, have your friends from high school or anything like that, the people who did stay, like, in, you know, yeah. New Hampshire and things like that, have they seen it and what did they take from it? Well, that's it funny. It's actually it? the forward in this the oh, play is, is uh, when I did Lost and Found is I had a group of guys come and visit me and it was like the first play they'd ever seen and great guys they came down yeah. and they were like that's awesome did you memorize those words and like you guys <laughs> and they were obsessed with the sandwich that I made in the play like, <laughs> 10 questions about that and uh, you know great sweet the way they were I, I mean look I'm not going to lie it was really rough growing up I felt when I first made uh, friends with gay men mm -hmm. that were openly gay and I definitely grew up with gay people who were terrified to say anything. Right. right but course. I was like, and they would explain their lifestyle, and I was like, oh my God, 
as a, an artist, that's how I, I was like a closeted artist. I was afraid right. to mm-hmm. reveal my true self because of peer pressure and all that other stuff. So anyway, I always felt connected to that. So, mm-hmm. I'll, you know, I didn't have that much support, certainly in the community I grew up with. I mean, I was way into sports and just causing trouble and doing shit. But I mean, you know, I love these guys. You know, they're, they're like family to me. But not they've not in my entire life they've never asked to read anything like uh-huh. what are you working on what's going on none of that stuff yeah I mean like one of the dudes who uh, one of the characters in Small Engine Repair is like based on when I ran in New York I'm like you gotta check this out he's like oh yeah I'll go he never showed up you know what I mean like it's yeah. fucking he would see it and be like oh that's me <laughs> yeah. but he never went so uh, you know it's kind of like kind of kind of like that so. Uh, what is this? What am I answering now? <laughs> I don't even know. At you're at, point, well, you're just wondering what the people that you grew yeah, up with. Oh, yeah. They no, I mean, so those cool. who saw it seem to you know what it is, is like <laughs> when you leave the life of creativity and yeah. like, you know, I definitely went to college and I studied and I've had a ton of jobs mm-hmm. um, to support myself because it was always like, how do you support yourself? Because there's yeah. no like, I didn't know anybody who was creative or making a living on that. I, nobody did. Right. And my parents, God, you know, love them. They were like, you gotta, have, you gotta have a job. You gotta. I mean, they're always really supportive, but they're, you know, what's your day job? Right. And it is a marathon. You gotta, you gotta sustain it. So, at the beginning, when all my friends and stuff were, you know, buying houses and all that shit, and I was like struggling, working in the mail room out here and trying to figure out the fuck I want to do and how do you do it and all that. Yeah. Um, towing that line, they. Uh, you know they're 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 making money and they're doing their stuff and right. they're like what is this idiot out there I, I do I do remember telling friends I was like oh you know I'm taking acting classes like you tell me dicks you suck in acting <laughs> you know like literally right. that kind of shit and you're like yeah. all right go fuck yeah, off fine. Yeah, sure. but then you re- turn a corner you know you hit mm-hmm. you hit your thirties and they're starting to maybe they're getting divorced or they're doing shit that they're like wow I don't like this job I have right. no because I do think as hard as it is to have a dream and a passion and like struggle because you just you're you're hungry to do it. That's painful, but what's more painful is to be sitting there and saying you don't know what you love, to not right. have that passion, to not have that frustration. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> but now I think they think it's kind of cool, right? More, you know, thank God, thanks to Facebook or whatever. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I think you know, you go from the like. Uh, being like, oh, I'm in acting class and things to being on like Mob City. I'm sure it. it makes well, no, you don't. Even, it's always the shit that you like. Don't even like. I bust my ass in Mob City. You're a great time, and not yeah. enough people watch that thing. Yeah. But then you know you're on a commercial selling Chase bank cards, and yeah. people. I've I high feel school like friends. I saw that. And I was like, ran I'm forever. Sure, but they're yeah. like, you finally made it. Your dreams are coming true. And I'm like, not really. No. You don't make that much money. Yeah. They, first Next of all, McDonald's. I did this Chase bank uh, <laughs> commercial, and on the callback, they made you sign the print rights out. Uh-huh. Which they don't usually do. I mean, whatever. And they usually you have to sign the print rights. I never get it because my because my hands are so fucked up. Like I box and they're all messed up. Oh wow! P- broke my uh, my fingers and shit playing basketball growing up. So they always they'll even like, they'll you know when I, they'll do my whole thing and then I'll have to hold up the product and they'll be <laughs> like, like send in the hand like a hand model like, <laughs> every time holding the steering wheel. They're just like they hate my hand. <laughs> so they they never use my print. But for this one, they took a picture of our faces. And they took that picture of me and this lovely girl everywhere. Like, I no people in Miami are like, it's on the side of a building. Side oh, wow. of like, I got paid maybe after commissions and everything, like maybe 1500 bucks. Right. And I'm telling you, and this thing everywhere. was everywhere. It was in newspapers. You're the face of Chase Bank. It was on the, it was, you went down like on the on the 10 to, towards downtown, and it was on the side of a building for like six no, months. No So you could Huge. see yourself. Do you, All the do you time. Get used, this is always the question I want to ask. Do you get used to it? Like... Oh yeah, there's a thing with my picture on it, like or well, I think that I, I get like... tickled by that. I think it's kind of silly. Yeah, um, it's just kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I've yet, to, I'm, you know, it's not like weird shit. I mean, if you're dressed up like a banana or like <laughs> a woman and you're like in a bikini or something like that, I mean, obviously, right. no one gives a fuck about that. Yeah, for for a dude like me, but um, no, I think it's you know, I, I I enjoy it. I mean, the great thing about theater is that when you act in theater, you're like really digging into it and it, it's not you're watching the tape later you're in the moment and that's really how it should be that's the healthiest way to be an actor yeah. but a lot of times you go and you do a guest star and you work and you're like you do like great takes and do all that stuff and then the final thing is that they're just cutting for you know whatever and they put little bits of it here and there right. and you, you just want to do your job well but those roles are rarely like wow that's some great work yeah. that I did there 
you know yeah, what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> it's just kind of like it's your it's the acting version of being like, well, I worked at you know Blockbuster for a little while. You're like, oh, I, I got to do it. Well, which know? was so fun about Mob City, and why I, I really really enjoyed that group and stuff is because you just you knew you were coming and you knew your character had more shit to do. Oh, right. well, they cut a lot of my character stuff, out, which <laughs> broke my heart. Uh, I'm right. That's I called Bernthal that night. Uh, John and I was like. Um, dude, they cut off all these scenes. I'm like, is, did I do something wrong? And he's like, no, it happens all the time. Because he's done it all <laughs> Yeah, right. he's been doing it for and a And then while. I called, I was just so was insecure. They're like, it happens every fucking book. But, uh, you know, that was cool because you kind of do your thing and you can kind of be a little more chill about it and then you're going to build it as opposed to you do a guest star, you shoot two days, you're like, I got to come on and do my fucking thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Was that like coincidence that like you ended up working on that show with like one well, of the Well, actually, best buds, uh, Frank Darabont came and saw it here and saw oh. me act and then okay. brought me in for it. Yeah, he cast me off that. Oh, oh, all right. That makes sense then. Because I was like, oh, that's so funny that that, you know. It kind of works that way. I mean, yeah. you know, you meet people. And John has a, had a great group of friends. And he, you know, I can't speak highly enough about him. He's such an incredible actor, but such a great guy. And he really attracts uh, a great, including Badge. I knew Badge through John as well because they were all in the Pacific together. He just yeah. attracts. Oh, I was going to, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you keep up like, uh, Josh Bitten was in. Josh Bitten, yeah. Or Bitten, yeah, he was in one of them. And like, best friends out here. Yeah, Josh I was like, Hellman how does he know all of these people Well, those from fuckers, the they went, and I auditioned for Pacific. But Did I just you? Was like, I mean, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> but uh, so they went off and, you know, fought this fake war. But the cool thing about it is like, that will never happen again. They spent six months in Australia doing boot camp and all that yeah. shit. And they all bonded. It was like yeah. a wonderful time. Oh, yeah. And they were just all all at positions in their career where they could afford that and it was all exciting you mm -hmm. know for them and uh, yeah they've all they've all stayed in close contact I've, I've met almost every guy I've met from that Pacific sort of contingent they've been really great guys yeah. That's and, cool. and I think I think uh, yeah, Meg Lieberman who uh, works at CBS now is this remarkable casting director she she'll actually be here tonight her, oh, nice. her husband Fred Pohl uh, participates in Rant and Rave a lot. Oh, cool. He did last month. She's coming. But she just has an eye for actors who are going to be kind of cool on a set and make it work. Mm -hmm. Something like that. You're out in Australia doing all that shit. Yeah. Similar to theater. you got to be people yeah. who you, you want to work with and you right. can trust. Yeah, I was going to say how important is that when you're like putting on a show or something like that to be able to have people who you can just be like chill with. Afterwards. Oh, it's crucial. I mean, it's crucial in theater. It's crucial in theater. You know, again, working those big equity shows, it's easier when you have stage managers and all this stuff. When you work here at Rogue Machine and you have <clears throat> very little money and you're changing in the lobby and you're yeah. doing all this shit. I mean, they've opened and shut so many fucking restaurants and clubs next door. But when we were doing small <laughs> engine repair, we'd be out there and you could hear like, everybody in the It's like a hip hop night <laughs> while we're there. And we're like doing the play and we're like, fuck it, make it work. But I'm yeah, going to tell you fun. the craziest story that ever happened to me okay. on stage. So the play was picking up some buzz and some WME, you know, fucking agent or whatever was talked and Kevin Spacey was like, I gotta go check this out. So he comes and he's sitting in the audience and we're all there. It was pretty early on and we're kinda of thrown by it. So uh, Michael Redfield was another really good buddy. He was in it, he was playing Packy and Josh Hellman was uh, <coughs> you know, was playing Chad and obviously Burn throws that. So Michael and I we have the first like eight to ten minutes together and we're doing it and about five minutes in it, the power goes out. So we're there and we're like <laughs> Fuck. David Maurer was that a technical director. He gets up and runs out. And we're like, let's just keep doing it and talking. And he had his phone and he's lighting it. And we're improvising a little bit just right. to stumble through. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the lights never came on. But what happened is every time somebody went off stage to take a piss, somebody in the backstage, this is how awesome Rogue Machine is, would give you a new flashlight. So we'd have new flashlights and lanterns. <laughs> And then a bunch of Rogue Machine people, they handed out flashlights to people in the audience that were flashing so they lights on. Cool. Yeah, oh, wow. and it was, uh, but it was, a, it, you know, we all thought in the moment, wow, we're going to talk about this in 10 years, about how it was the most organic <laughs> acting that we were like in the moment and discovered shit and like you just turned it off and went in the zone. No, it was terrible. It was like, I mean, oh, we I were thought just, that was going to be the end of the story. No, no, no. no. Like, yeah, we were just, know. we barely got through it. The glass is broken. It's doing all this shit. It changes. It's not as funny of a play in the dark with a fucking light and a gun up against the guy. I mean, we stumbled through it. And had to like ad lib and all that shit, <laughs> and got through oh, it. Man. And uh, but it was terrible, and the lights yeah, never sure. went on. And of course, it was a night Kevin Spacey. <laughs> well, yeah. Did you I mean, did he did he like stay and talk to you no, or anything? I mean, he talked a little bit. He was he's like, like you know, he's like, well, noble attempt. <laughs> he was like, he said how he did some play at Shakespeare in the Park, and uh, I mean, when you get off stage, you're super fucking insecure, kind of, because yeah. you just want people to. You know, if someone's like, oh, yeah, that was, uh, wow, that was a uh, you know, really good sandwich you made. I mean, you're like, you hate it, I hate it. Because uh, it's so hard. I mean, yeah. even if you see somebody in the worst play imaginable, it takes so much guts to go do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you just want to be like, fine. And, you know, you don't have to lie to your friends and say you love it. But you've got to be like, that was noble that you did that. Yeah. Which is true. 
and then you know of course you you love some plays you don't have. but uh but yeah I mean he, he was cool about it but you know it, it was not a good fucking play I mean, it, was, <laughs> it wasn't but there were some idiots in the audience who were like oh really I thought that was intentional <laughs> And then somebody's like, you should do that every night. Like, uh, like people no. are dumb. Yeah. yeah. But it was it was it Now was, who's was the funny. coolest person who has been like, you are an awesome writer? Like who is like the person oh, who's right. like Well, been into there was a couple of them in, in, in New York. Uh, yeah. Neil Labute. Oh wow. Was yeah. awesome. He actually read the script ahead of time for MCC and he sent out this email to all the MCC subscribers who were like, This play's awesome, check it out. I was <laughs> That's like, fantastic. I was like crying at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the the guys who do Game of Thrones came with Amanda Pete. I'm a huge Amanda Pete fan. Okay. But those guys came and I was like, You guys are awesome and they they hung out with us for uh, for a long while and they were really great. Steve Earle came one night, he's a musician, I loved yeah. him. Um, yeah, we got really, really lucky. Uh, yeah, That's but yeah, the cool. Game of Thrones guy, we're all, and and I just really respect them. They were just so cool, and um, you know, you meet people who. It's not like they're so happy when they see stuff that they love too. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I just it was such a thrill to feel like, wow, somebody who's given me so much enjoyment that I can too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that, yeah, that sure. sort of meant so much. Yeah, it makes it like reciprocal, and you know, <laughs> yeah, you just kind of feel like you're, yeah, you're like kind of belong to something bigger than you. Yeah, definitely. We totally went like straight in here. <laughs> How much time we got? Don't know it's six fifty four, and you. I'm not getting to... hit up, so we have probably. Okay, great. Minutes, so. Okay, perfect. So. I just you know we del- at least that's good that we delved right yeah, in as totally. a result since we're out of it. Should we like go backwards and then we can work forwards again? Sure. Mm-hmm. I don't we should ask you about your top three. Oh, yeah, top three. Top three what? Uh, first. Top, yeah. Um, we've been talking a lot of remakes. Yeah, we've been talking about oh, recently remakes. because there's like Ghostbusters and there's yeah. talk of Indiana Jones and some other stuff. So we were saying if you could be in a remake, what were the top three? Like, oh. re- like what role yeah, would you want to play? Would you want to play? I mean, because the problem is, is like the stuff you love, you really, really you love, you would never want right. to see done again. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But if there's maybe there was something that we we're like, eh, I probably could have done that better. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Maybe. Dude, you can look at it either thing. way. Yeah. That'd be a tough one. Well, of course, you know, when they remade those Star Wars movies with J.J. Abrams, you're like, oh my God, that'd be so fucking awesome. <laughs> I'm sure everyone, you know, is like, yeah, how do I get into I was that? not in that cool school. I know a lot of people were, they took a meeting on this. Um, but, uh... I'm going to start saying that now. Yeah. I took a meeting on But, yeah, I, I definitely was not in that loop. But I was like, that That would be awesome. Sure. I mean, obviously, I think Raiders of the Lost... I think Indiana Jones was my the biggest singular hero of my life as a yeah. kid. You know, watching him and... Oh, I can't wait till I don't have to shave. Like, <laughs> I mean, he, he really dictated this is, so this much. This is what it is the, yeah, the reason inspiration was, for this. Yeah. But he was kind of, uh, you know, as a kid, like uh, very much like, well, that's a man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. The, yeah. Sort of thinking that, and you know, of course, that, I mean, God, that would be incredible. But right. I don't think they should. They want to remake that movie. Yeah, supposedly. We yeah. Just we have mixed feelings on mixed it as Chris Pratt fans, fans, but also but also Indian Indiana fans. Jones fans. So I'm like, I don't feel like you need to redo it. Like it's fine the way it was. Yeah, it's then great. what are you doing impersonation? I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, you want to invent new stuff and, mm-hmm. and, and kind of keep forging ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean. Sometimes they do cool stuff. Like one of my favorite shows was Fargo on TV. Oh, is it good? Oh, Jesus, it's awesome. And I met that guy Noah Hawley. I uh, I took a meeting with him. Uh, he was he was awesome. They're so great. And what what I'm saying is is like they took a movie, they didn't remake it, but they they drew upon that. Right? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Which is what I was so skeptical of. I was like, I mean, Fargo's great. I don't know what to make of making a TV show of it, but it works. It was so great. Okay. It was so awesome. It kind of is one of those rare things where you see it, and you know, I'm working more in the TV and the film space. Uh, especially as a writer, and it was kind of like, oh, that's a new kind of way to tell a story, mm-hmm. and, and that was really exciting to kind of emerge from with that at the yeah. end of that. Yeah, I thought that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, I don't know what those were. <laughs> so maybe Indiana Jones. Or... You know, one of my favorite movies I would love to be is Midnight Run. I'd love to play Robert De Niro's character in a remake I've of that. Never seen oh my god, yeah, you gotta go see it. Okay. What What is that even like? What is that about? It's it uh, actually that guy came to Small to repair the writer. Of that. Oh, I was like, Robert <laughs> That guy. Robert no, he didn't. Oh, Bobby D. Bobby D. Let's go, Bobby. <laughs> um, uh, so it's like Charles. What the fuck is his name? <laughs> Jesus, it's like. Don't worry about it. I'm just really glad so you're yeah, on the same page as us. It's De Niro today. and Charles Groden. Okay. Right? And oh, it's like kind of a, it's like yeah. a buddy cop <laughs> movie, but it's it's got this really, it's unbelievably uh, funny, mm-hmm. but also really kind of edgy and dark okay. and also intense. And it's got great action and great characters, and there's actually some legitimately poignant scenes in it. Okay, it's a great movie. It, like, is it like it, me, like is it genre wise? Is it supposed to be like comedy or is it's it genre? Like, it's like a crime comedy. A crime comedy, I would say, which I love crime comedies. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to do because, you know, like Pulp Fiction or mm -hmm. stuff like that. I mean, like Tarantino is like a hero of mine. It's right. like he hits the he hits that thing. Yeah. Scorsese does it a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think a lot of times everything should have, everything should be f funny. Too. Yeah. Like, your I life agree. is funny. And those scary guys, like those those bad motherfuckers, they're the funniest people you've ever met. Right. <laughs> like, the, like the Especially like the mob guys, you know what I mean? They're just funny guys. Yeah. So, wait, now in this, your dream casting, your, are you Robert De Niro or are you Charles Gordon? Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. Okay. I mean, come on, look at my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair Sorry. enough. Sorry. Sorry. Number, <laughs> number three. You've got two, right? Oh, that's Indiana Jones. It, wait. Indiana Jones. But you said Star Wars. Oh, Star I said Wars. I would Just like, like to be generic. Star Wars. Because yeah. there's still more movies. I yeah. Think. That's it's true. Not, there's really time. You can be anybody in that. You can... Yeah. The universe is expanding. You can be... Somebody. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard, like... Uh, and, and it is, like, as an actor, you get... You hear these new things coming out, and you're like, oh, shit, I'm missing that, or whatever. I mean, it's a very frustrating um, thing, being yeah. an actor like that. But I would say the most rewarding things I've ever done, it's like, you didn't know about them before. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you kind of create your own yeah. thing. Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. I mean, it would But I'm not on that different. short list of people that, yeah. that you get, you know, get your own on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that how it works when they make these things? They have well, like no. a group of people that they're like, this is Well, absolutely. There's, there's, there's lists yeah. and, um, for certain categories, and they'll work their way down that list. And then, you know, for TV, it's different. They'll audition mm -hmm. stuff. But still, they go to that list and they'll give those people those offers. And, you know, I know like in pilot season and shit, I'm usually busier at a certain part where you're like I know everybody who has a name is either doing a show mm -hmm. or said no and now they need new people or people mm -hmm. who they kind of know but they don't really know yeah you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that so is the goal sort of get on one of these lists I don't is know man like I mean to... I'm kind of like I'm I'm doing a lot of stuff I mean the writing has really taken off it's yeah. amazing which is great um, I just love acting so much <laughs> I love it's so fun but it makes me a better writer so I kind of you know do, do it and see what happens so yeah like, I mean, I'm not going out for uh, as many smaller parts as I used to because mm -hmm. I'm very busy with the writing. You know what right. I'm saying? So yeah. I don't have to like fill the yeah the, the little crevices with it. It's um, not just something that you like have to do all the time anymore. Yeah, I would just I just don't have the bandwidth really at the moment. To, right. Because uh, I'm on you know deadlines and things like that. So. And a lot of people who do like uh, theater stuff say they hate doing like TV and movies and things like that. I mean, is it? No, I mean, I, it's definitely different. I mean, theater is like you're, like to use a, you know, an exercise analogy is like theater is like you're going to the gym and you're bench pressing 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the set and they're like, can you bench press that, you know, 80 pound weight? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, I'll yeah, do sure. it. You do a really good job, but you're not going to really push yourself. Yeah. It's very rare that TV or film will do that. Now, some people do have like those few roles like the Brian Cranston, Aaron Paul, mm -hmm. they're doing that. But even not every week, you know, and, yeah. and you do discover stuff, the truth in, in theater and the, and the language and the connection with an audience. It's just you're not going to find that anywhere else. So mm -hmm. you kind of get that on the stage and then you find these other things. I mean, being in movies and TVs is a blast. It's mm -hmm. really, really fun and it's, uh, you know, it's great working with a director and you get a camera. It's just a different set of stakes because you're not yeah. making the reality there. You're not layering it a little bit. You're yeah. kind of just fucking around and going with it and making choices and seeing what works and then they edit it and they do what they want. Yeah. Right, yeah. So it's, it's out just, of your hands. It's now. just a different animal. I mean, I, I think that if, you know, I think you ha a lot of it's just balance. It's like having a lot of that to do, you know what I mean? And for me, that's always been balance is like doing all that stuff. So if yeah. you were to become like giant TV star, everybody knows your name, or movie star, things like that, would you still primarily or need to come back to theater and writing? Oh yeah, theater, theater will always like be that. part of my life. Um, I love writing plays. Most stuff I think of is a play. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I love movies and TV, and that pays really well, and that's sort of giving me a career to be able to do the stuff that I want. Yeah. Um, but theater is just always will be in my blood. I think it's always kind of like you rotate the crops, you stay fertile creatively, yeah. and you go back to that. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there's nothing. I, I watch a movie that I love and it inspires me and it stays with me. But theater really has like one night you can just throw you off and really feel something. It's a different yeah. type of story. I mean, a lot of times. You know, people will see a play or a small engine and be like, oh, this would be a great movie. And I'm kind of like, I just have different parts in my mind. I, you know, a lot of like what makes it such a good play would not make it a good movie. Mm -hmm. So it has to be that singular thing. Right. Like I'm not writing plays as fodder for potential movies. Yeah. You know, I, my, I have ideas for movies. You do that other stuff. And, and uh, yeah, it's kind of a balance. But I, I always, you know, that my plan is to always have uh, an outlet theater. 
Yeah, which I imagine is why having a place like this is so important that oh, yeah. to be able to be, no, no matter crucial. what, this is what you And that's why I'm saying like all that equity to. bullshit is like, it's yeah. scary for people in my position because right. you don't have that ability. And whatever, you can research on it. People smarter than me have different <laughs> opinions. <clears throat> but I know how much I've gained yeah. from working in situations where I was paid very little as an actor mm -hmm. or a writer, but you gain so much out of it. Yeah, That's absolutely. All. Yeah, so it's hitting close to home to have these oh, kinds yeah, totally. of things like shakeups. And I mean, look, happening. to be honest, is like I'm at a point now where I'm starting to get my place produced elsewhere. That mm -hmm. it's not like I need the equity waiver yeah. like I used to, but I don't want it to go away. I always want yeah. to have it. And you know, we have, <clears throat> as my friend Kemp Power said, who did a play here, which launched hugely. It's running in Baltimore now. It's like might be the best selling um, play they ever had at this theater in Baltimore, The National. Wow. Um, but he did it here, right over there. Really? Like, same theater, small engine repair. We started it. But he, as he puts it, he's like, you get these great playwrights. Christopher Shin and, you know, uh, Enda Walsh. Huge playwrights are doing plays at our theater company mm -hmm. in L.A. at the equity waiver level because they just know you're getting quality production. Yeah. And you can actually get it done. It doesn't cost $200,000. You don't have to right. fundraise or Kickstarter or any of that shit. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, what was our other... Top three. Oh, top three. Oh yeah, movies that shouldn't be remade. Uh, uh, movies that shouldn't be remade. Chinatown. Okay. <laughs> I can't imagine anyone being like, let's remake Chinatown. That's I know. Right. Like then again, yeah. Then again, they're redoing any of ET. Anything. They shouldn't remake ET. No. I bet that one will. You think? No. I, it's uh, such a magical movie. It is. That's one of my favorite of all time. I I can see that being one of those ones that they feel like. Enough time has passed. Like, let's introduce this to a new. Let's do a CGI. Like, yeah. no. Like, he was Super so Super 8 wasn't enough. Well, they redid yeah. it with some CGI, and then they went back. Did they when they re-released it? See, when they do that, though, people yeah. always hate it. Like, they, they did do. that same thing with Star Wars. Remember, they right. tried to make a CGI. Like, yeah. just go back to regular. It was fine. What's funny too is like, I watched with my daughter who's ten. She watches all that shit with me, and like, we're watching. We get the Blu-rays of the Star Wars, and it's not the original ones. It's no. the one with like Jabba the Hutt. Walking. And it like walking, yeah. and Sophie's like, "This is terrible." She's like, this is, <laughs> the ten-year-old is like, "It looks Whoa. like a video game." And yeah. and she literally she turned to me. She's like, "Is this this is a joke? Is this like why not?" Because so much of it is gorgeous, and then but yeah. at the time he's like, "Oh, this is cutting edge polygon, whatever." Yeah. Um, <laughs> definitely don't remake that. And yeah. uh, a third one, uh, one of my favorite movies of all times is uh, Goodfellas, which uh, had a mm. magic there yeah. that mm -hmm. you couldn't remake that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh the, yeah, the chemistry. And, yep. That's a, those are interesting picks because I feel like like Goodfellas again too. I can see that that like being a thing someone tries to. Well, do I think do. all of those movies, especially Goodfellas, has like and shit, man. I'm sure I've written stuff that people would be like, "You're trying to be Goodfellas, right?" <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's it's. But again, it's that like, it's he he gets this area where you're entertained and laughing and terrified and mm -hmm. sick to your stomach yeah. and like holy shit it's almost like you don't realize how funny that movie is until you see it the second time because you're like yeah. not as after terrified after you're not as like <laughs> yeah like not at all <laughs> yeah that which that's how I would like Tarantino movies when I see mm -hmm. him I'm like riveted and then I see him again and I'm like holy shit that was <laughs> like, oh I missed all of that the first yeah, time yeah you do you yeah. miss it because you're just worried about something terrible happening yeah you're, that's that's actually true yeah <laughs> so let's, uh, let's just that's talk a little bit now have you seen the trailer for Crimson Peak? Yeah. Crimson Bake? Peak. Peak. No, what's Crimson that Crimson Bake. I like the idea. It's about making red velvet cupcakes. It's, uh, it's delightful. Make a tent. No, I have not seen that one. With your hands. Crimson Peak. Chris, uh, why don't you... Crimson Peak is... Here she is. Hey, Oh, love. hey. Hi. Hello. Say hello to... Welcome. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, John's wife. Nothing. Um, Crimson, Crimson Peak. Peak is Guillermo del Toro, and it's a... Horror oh, film. I love okay, it's F a horror right? film with uh, Tom Hiddleston and Mia. I can always mess up. Watch Gus Kowska. You know the one from Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, Wonderland. and oh, right. she was in Jane Burton. Eyre. Yeah. Okay, that girl, uh, Charlie Hunnam and Jessica Chastain, and so uh, it, from the trailer, what I'm gathering is that Tom Hiddleston marries Mia's character, and they're in this like super creepy house that's got some kind of evil ghost story going on in it and Jessica Chastain is his Tom Hilson's sister and they have some kind of weird like oh, creepy it thing weird going on. It gets yeah. weird at the end and to I think Charlie Hunnam is trying to help Mia not be there. I'm not really sure what his deal is. <laughs> you got all this from the trailer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's very observant when it comes say. to trailers. Um, <laughs> Usually I watch them and I'm like there was a part where a pretty thing happened. <laughs> and I'm like no did you see that one time when like the hand came and you're like oh. Yeah. Um, but and I'm usually not and especially um, Jim Beaver's in it too. I didn't see him in the remember. Are you that, familiar with Jim, Jim Beaver? Jim I know Jim Beaver. He's a big uh, supporter of LA theater. Yeah, 
Exactly. He's always doing like cool shows, like one man shows. He's a great guy. I'm like Facebook friends with him, and he posts shit on the feed where you're like, I mean, it's not like he knows me. I saw him at a, (laughs) I did a fundraising event with him that I had to perform in, and I was like, dude, I, you know, I love this and this fucking thing you did in Deadwood. And he's like, oh yeah. (laughs) You know, he went on. (laughs) Julian sounds good. I mean, there's like these older guys, like guys who have these crazy, because they're just used to people like acting like idiots around them. Yeah. And then he's like, I'll just stop talking. Yeah. That's no, a, no, no, he was. I mean, wanting to be our grandpa, we do. essentially. Yeah. You, he's supposed to be my TV uncle. TV uncle, yeah. yes. We're, we're working on assembling a TV family, uh, family for Kristen. Yeah, Scott, uh, Bacula Scott Bacula Bacula is my TV dad. dad. Okay, I'll see that. And uh, yeah, Jim Beaver is the TV uncle. So, uh, I feel like they would get along Chris, really Kristen well. Dunst could be your like older sister. Yeah. Hey, there we go. She can be. I can we should add it. her in there. In my, you could, I don't have any family. siblings yet, so we could add her in there. Yeah. Do you have a, Do you have a TV family? No. You know, yeah. and have a TV I family. Really do you need a TV sister? <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, I like it. TV brother. <laughs> yes. Jack Lono. Awesome. Uh, do you know what's funny? Is well, I get my uh, wife has been cast as my sister in a couple of places. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. That's some it's like very weird. that's like Dexter right there. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that uh, uh, Michael C. Hall and mm-hmm. Jenna. And oh, I never watched Dexter. What's her name? Chris but, Pratt used to date. What's her face when they were on um, Everwood together? They were brother and sister. Aubrey Plaza. No, <laughs> that's a wrong show. No, wrong show. <laughs> Everwood's Everwood, like a while ago. She was the girl that was in. Uh, she's Is in Revenge Emily, now. Yeah, Emily and Vandercamp. Vander Camp. You're adding syllables. Yeah. Yeah. Put it both ways. Anyway, they were dating when they were on Everwood, and they were playing Mary Sister. Is that, is that is that weird? No, I mean I don't. You know, I think it's dangerous if you're on a show and you date your co-star because. Uh, it's either Pixie. marriage and matching headstones. That's the good ending. <laughs> yeah, right. Or it's gonna burst into flames. Yeah, or you spend you know seven seasons of something with someone who you're like, oh, that's my. Ad. Yeah, I, I used to do that. Well, I mean, you know, and I would like, it's if it's one of those that you like fall hard for, then it can be hard. Yeah, then you and I would got just a like fucking light the whole set on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you're that guy. Have, huh? You're just like this is like, not gonna work. <laughs> no, it's just hard. This is gonna be painful for everyone. <clears throat> yeah, it's just not gonna because it's either they're gonna like you, you know, it's gonna be just. But you know, sometimes you know, you, you certainly you date somebody and you're like, hey, you know, it's just I think you're great, it's just not working out. And they're yeah. like, yeah, that's cool. That's very rare. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the norm. It's not the norm. Especially, uh, I imagine. But you they know, pay you so much that you're like, fuck it, we'll make this work. <laughs> it's like San Francisco. Yeah, My cousin was dating this girl and they lived together and then they broke up and he stayed oh, with her for like a year. He's yeah. like, it's so hard to find an apartment. Yeah, it's a million Ooh. dollars for your apartment. Yeah, there. so they stayed together for a while. Yeah, you, you kind of got it. I've known people who have done that, too. Like, just, like... In fact, one of our friends, his parents were, like, divorced, and they lived together for, like, years after that because it was just kind of like, well, well yeah. we're here, and we share kids, and, you know... Might as, might as, well. as well. Yeah, might as well. We're in the neighborhood. <laughs> Why not? So well, hey, I don't know. But, you know, the secret to relationships really is that, <clears throat> you know, you got to stick it out because it's not always, like, you know, uh, moonbeams and, you know, sunshine. Right. You get hard times, and yeah. then you got to stick through it. If the person's someone who's worth it, and then it gets better. It always gets better. It's just, it just goes up and down. Right. That's just how it is. You know what I'm saying? And I think like, I just think a lot of people don't get over that bump. Yeah, sometimes. definitely. And not to say when you're dating someone for two months, if you hit that bump, fuck that. It's yeah, you're like you're done. Super That's great the easy, and easy part. So yeah. I'm saying you get kids, <clears throat> stuff like that. Life can get hard. Yeah, and I actually loved. I watched. Um, is it Sex and Marriage? Was that the oh, yeah, that web this, series? Yeah, the web series. Oh, you and I, that? I did watch that. And um, I mean, we're both like we're huge Fast and Furious fans. So obviously, Justin oh, yeah. Lin being at the you know center of this whole network was super cool. Yeah, he's awesome. But I thought that was one of the interesting things about that show in general was that looking at like these bumps that you hit within marriage and that being sort of the key difference between like say the therapists and what right. the the therapies. They're patience. <laughs> That's the yeah, word. We had fun with that, and we kind of—I yeah. think that it was <clears throat> it was successful and a great director, Robin Larson. And I think <clears throat> you know, it's successful in, in hitting sort of a very complicated, funny, just truthful thing mm-hmm. for that little what it was. I mean, what, you know, we kind of was like it should have gone. I mean, we just sort of touched yeah. the surface of it, but everybody got real busy and stuff. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen where that uh, that went from there, but I, I yeah. enjoyed that sort well, of. I can tell you where that. it went. Oh, you had me. I was like, really? Where was it going to go? <laughs> well, I, I'm just trying to think. I'm trying to think how it ended. Which is with their lives fucked up. Yeah, well, you know, you, you and your wife in this uh, end up sort of realizing you're on the up and up, but the therapists are falling apart. Well, that's true. You know, I, my wife and I went to couples therapy once, and like the therapist was like in this mood, and it was just like, we saw her get into her car, and the car was like really fucked up. <laughs> like, there's a story like, here. You just, yeah, you were like, I didn't want to know you were a person. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that the way it is with, like, all forms of, like, therapists and things like that? It's like, the best ones are probably the ones that are, like, really screwed up. And, yeah. Because they know. 
Well, and it's like you can give really good advice to somebody without necessarily having to take, take it, it yourself. yourself. Right, yeah. exactly. I don't know. That was kind of that was fun for me watching that. that oh, I'm short. glad you watched it. I recommend it. It's on the YouTube's. Check it out. I'll that link so to it funny, on the blog. Because YouTube is the worst. Because <laughs> you know it really is. And I guess they're better about comments now. But you'll put up something, uh, and you'll you'll be like, we did the thing, and they'll be like. The first comment on that was like, "That's the gayest piece of shit I've ever seen." <laughs> the guy with the monkey face fucking that chick. LOL. And like literally that bad. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, "What is wrong?" Like, you have it, to you just, lose faith in the world you if you read YouTube comments. We had this whole rant about it a couple weeks ago, where I was like, "Just why? Yeah, like, you're like not why? doing anything constructive uh, or beneficial to anybody. You're just yeah. being awful." Yeah, you ones. have to. I mean, I believe in the good of humanity in general, that it's just some knucklehead. I mean, right. the, the equivalent of like when I when I was 13 and I threw rocks at a house or egged or did right. some stupid shit. This is the internet version of that. Yeah. Just sitting true, there yeah. and doing like, no one listens to me. I can't do anything. So I'm going to try to provoke a response. Yeah. And you don't say, excuse me, that was a very challenging thing. You write some, you know, the <laughs> troll thing. It's yeah. still awful. I mean, we need to figure out how to like get rid of that in the Oh, just like in inhumanity. Well, That's and what I, we I just don't like the toxicity of the, the the racial and the sexist stuff. Yeah, like the whole Gamergate thing, like those uh, fuckers. Jesus oh man, Christ. yeah, that was that was the subject of uh, Law and Order SVU this week. Oh, was uh, it really? Have you been on SVU? This is always the thing. The like, show? Yeah, the the show. But not, I see it sometimes when I'm like, oh, Jet Blue or whatever. Yeah, this is a. Uh, it's like every time I go to like a play, any of the programs that show like what everyone was. Oh, saying, has everybody been on? It's like I yeah. Do I watch it? Well, no, it's on no. for twenty years. Yeah, it's been on for no, so they, long. They that, like, everybody's cast, been in it. They cast in New York. Oh yeah, that would make but, sense. Like, everybody, <laughs> every actor in New York has been on. I actually yeah. do. I have like okay. five minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, good. we'll finish. Well, actually, I mean, it's not like we really need to go through these trailers. The, yeah, the yeah. pop culture is just sort of getting well, conversation I, maybe going. Maybe just burn through them, and I'll tell you. Yeah. If I've okay. Seen have you seen what else do we have? Aloha. Aloha. That's the new Cameron Crowe. It's basically Elizabeth Town in Hawaii. No, uh, it sounds cool though. I like okay. it. Okay, yeah, I was <laughs> watching like it. You're like, sold on Elizabeth Town in Hawaii. Yeah, of well, it's Brad Krasinski, Cooper, Bradley Cooper, Bradley Cooper. who's yeah. like I've decided is like looking at the sun. He's so beautiful that John I have Krasinski? to look. No. no. Well, he's also beautiful, he's beautiful but like a different Bradley kind. Bradley Cooper. Every Bradley time Cooper. I like, I can only look at him for so long, and I'm like, I can't keep looking at you he's because too much. you're too beautiful. I love it. Anyway, that's totally side tangent. And McAdams. Rachel, Rachel McAdams, McAdams yeah. is in it. I feel like we're missing And Bill something. Murray. Bill Murray. That yeah. was the weird thing about it. Because this is kind of like, like how she put it, Elizabeth Town in Hawaii. Like putting like and Bill Alec Baldwin. Murray and Alec Baldwin. That's but Bill Murray time. is like, like it's like impossible to get him in things. And you have to like, he oh, sets up like that. a secret P.O. No, box is like, and all that. His like, life will be looked at as like a work of bizarre art. Right? Think, in retrospect. This yeah. is what like James Franco wishes he were. And like, <laughs> I just, with Bill Murray, I just think it's so funny for this to be something that he's in. Like of all the scripts that probably people yeah. try to pass off to him. Maybe and he gets to go to Hawaii. And he's like, oh, he's like, I feel good about that. That's a trick to get to Hawaii. Yeah, I guess, so. you know, you take the vacation or whatever, yeah. but I don't know. I'm it's playing. an interesting one. And then what was, oh, now The Man From Uncle. Oh, The Man Uncle. From Uncle remake. I didn't see that. Henry Cavill. I haven't seen it. It's mostly all these new trailers. Yeah, right? Henry Cavill see, and Army Hammer. You. you know what website <laughs> I love is uh, Film Drunk? Have you ever go to that? That sounds familiar. You know familiar. what Uprox is? Yes. Yes. Check out the Uprox things. But there's this writer named Heather Dockray. Okay. I met her in New York, and she is funny and smart and, like, awesome. You should check her stuff out. But okay. she does, like, reviews and things of movies. So so great. Okay, Good. and this is this film is on, drunk or on Uprox. filmdrunk.com. Oh, film drunk. Which is part of the Uprox like family. Like family. And okay. they have uh, Warming Glow, which is the TV. I think those are my two favorite blogs that I read okay. like every day. Oh, okay. Noted. Then yeah. we'll check that out. Heather Dockray. D O C K R A Y. Okay. I feel like I've seen that name before. I read a lot of various criticism <clears throat> and things like that. But yeah, Man from Uncle. Yeah, Army Hammer. Army Hammer and yeah. Henry Cavill, Henry Cavill. aka Superman. Um, who else was in that? Um, some like French girl that I didn't know. Oh, <laughs> that could be cool. Is it Guy Ritchie, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's Guy Ritchie. Awesome. That's it. Looks really fun. I thought it looked yeah, fun. I, mean, I went I'll, and saw. I'll, it was the trailer before I went and saw Kingsman: Secret Service on Friday. How was that? It was really good. It looks actually. fun too. It was pretty yeah, funny it and Colin Firth is amazing. I was about to say now. So how old is your your boy? He's like three and a half, three weeks old. Um, three and a half weeks old. But inevitably, it's like we have a night off. We go to the play to see a friend in a play. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, I got a pretty badass TV, so it's not like I feel like missing something. Right. But I don't get to go. I don't go to the movies as much as I I, I should. You just wait for the red box or whatever. I and, guess, or yeah. I mean, we rent do it on Amazon. Pay per view, to be honest, we uh, do that shit yeah. all the time. There you go. You don't have yeah. to leave. I know. This you don't have to leave. Now you but can I do get like for the right Amazon. movie. We'll, we'll. I mean, it's different with kids brand new, but like. You know, <laughs> We'll do like when he just picked little, him up at the grocery yeah, store. Yeah, when he gets a little rusty, maybe we'll yeah, yeah. move on to something else. 
Okay. Well, we should let you get to get He's to here, where. actually. Yeah. 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 But is there anything you, you want to tie up? Is there like that's um, a where can we find you? Yeah, where can we find you on the internet? On the internet. You can tell them. Oh, uh, I'm kind of. I do Twitter, Instagram. <laughs> You seem unsure about that. Yeah. I do, and I'm not like a massive user of it. Hey, but we can be friends. I'm yeah, we can do it. I, um, but like, Instagram's really fun. So it's, it's like just pictures of my phone. kids and my dogs mostly. But oh, everybody. Loves but Twitter's those. cool. Um, you know, promoting a lot of shit, uh, like plays and stuff, or, or different deals that pop up. I think that's pretty cool. Because I think because Keegan Allen and I are friends on Twitter, so it's like <laughs> I get all of his fans. And I'll look and I'll be like, like Where did you come Keegan's from? wife is now following him. And I'm like, I know he's not married. Some girl in Nebraska <laughs> says she's Keegan's wife. Well, so that's there's a lot be of those. Okay. Yeah. So at John Polono on Twitter slash Instagram. It's Jay Polono. Jay Polono. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know. I did. Asked. I started Twitter a long time ago and forgot I had it. So you I didn't know to brand realize, yourself. I didn't time. know to brand like. Can, I guess I could do it, but yeah, I, you can change it. Could you lose all your followers though? No, I don't think so. I, I think you can. I, I know you're, you're not asking. As long me. As no, yeah, I don't know why I even looked at all right, you. Can you, you email no me? Figure that out. Yeah. I should look at that because I was like, fuck, I want to do something kind of a little bit cooler than than that. Right. Just lame. I just was like, you know. Yeah, that's fun. So check him out on the interwebs. Thank you so much for joining no, us. This was coming. a lot of fun. Hey, so that was it. That was our chat with John Polono. He was super rad. Thanks again for stopping by the show, John. We really loved having you. And thanks for having us at Rant and Rave um, over there at, um, oh my gosh, Rogue <laughs> Machine <laughs> Theater. That small mechanical part. Small mechanical place that we go. Yeah. Rogue <laughs> Machine Theater. Thanks so much for having us. You were amazing and a great host. Um, also, thanks to the Girl Scout cookies from your daughter. So that was so rad that. as well. Um, and you guys, thanks for listening to us. And we had a really great time this week. It was fun to kind of do a little road trip, um, get out of our perspective offices and, and get out in the world and meet real people and hang out. So um, as per usual, be sure that you rate and review us on iTunes. Give us a listen on Stitcher, SoundCloud, all that stuff. Follow us on Twitter at Electric Band Cave. You can follow <laughs> us also on Facebook now. We have one of those things. Um, and doing all that sort of good stuff. If you were, you should be excited, some people, because you're getting something in the mail because Corey and I were able to meet up and kind of put together your packages. So if you've been waiting for that anxiously, you'll have to wait just a teensy bit more. <laughs> but they are en route almost. Yes. So um, anyway, be looking out for those. And until next time, I'm Kristen Lateral. I'm Corey Gunvon. Take care, guys. Peace out, everybody. Oh, God. <laughs> Let me start over. <laughs> <laughs> Too many slashes. Okay. You well, well, too. Do you want to take that out? Yeah. You want to spit it in my hand? That was gross. Don't no, swallow it. I swallowed it. That was gross. Right. I'm sorry. I'm a five-year-old. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's hard. It's been a long day. Hard. Okay, here we go.